This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is the This is the air I breathe. There's nothing worth more. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of lives, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. In your presence, holy. Oh
Good morning. The Lord be with you. Welcome this morning to First Presbyterian Church. We are glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. Um, Richard and I were just saying how wonderful it is to hear all the chatter um, in the room. So it's wonderful, the excitement that we have today, um, welcoming Richard and his family to the life of this congregation. Welcome to those of you who are worshiping with us online. We are glad you are here. I have a litany of announcements because guess what? It is September and we are revving things up and there is lots to do. So I want to remind you that immediately following worship, you are invited to go to the fellowship hall have for a reception where we'll welcome um, and, and greet Emily and Anna and Ella and their friends. Um, we're excited to have them here, but Richard and his family are going to go this way. You all go that way. Okay, let them, let them go. And then, um, but please do join us. There are there's things to eat, lots of homemade goodies, and um, we're excited to see each other. So that's immediately following the worship service. Wednesday night supper starts back this week. I don't know about you, but I am ecstatic about not having to cook on a Wednesday and be with you all. So sign up online if you would like or call the church office and tell Kim to put your reservation in. We do have a form for standing reservations up to a point, so be sure to get your name on the list for Wednesday night supper, 530. Next week, we will begin our regular worship schedule. So we will have 930 Kairos in the fellowship hall, We will have 1115 worship in the sanctuary, and in between, from 10, help me out, is it 15 or 1030? A few of a few of us know, a few of us. 1015 until 11, we have Sunday school for all ages. So note that next week, 930 Kairos, 1015 Sunday school, 1115 worship in the sanctuary. Our stewardship dinner is October 16th. Richard will be our guest speaker. I guess he's not really a guest. You're you're just our speaker. Um, Richard is our speaker, so be sure to sign up for that. It is also online. There are lots of things to sign up for online, such as flowers for each of the worship spaces. So please put that on your calendar and make sure you're signed up. 
Nominations for the class of elder for 2025 are due by this Friday. So if there is someone the Spirit has put on your heart, ask them first and then submit their name by this Friday. Many of our Bible studies are beginning either this week or have begun. Our Friday morning men's group already met last week. Our Tuesday morning men's group will meet starting this Tuesday, and our Bible studies for women in circles have also started this week. So be sure to check online or to call the church office if you have any questions about that. I believe, people of God, that we are ready to begin worship. Those of you in the back still looking for a seat, there's pew space right up front here, so come on down. Now I invite you to stand as you are able and join with me in the call to worship. Let praise of God resound in the heavens. Open your hearts and spirits this day.
Friends, it is not what you have done, but who Christ is. And it is not who we are, but what Christ has done that assures us when we come to this place and tell the truth, our God hears and our God forgives. In that spirit, let us pray the prayer this morning first together and then in silence. Creating God, you gift us with beauty and bounty and call us to share. But we confess that too often we allow fear and anger to diminish us. We fail to give, fail to love, fail to make room, fail to dream. Forgive us. May we imitate your expansive grace and endless creativity. Draw us with desire to be part of a serving community where all are welcomed and none are forgotten. And let the people of God together say, Hear and see the good news. Our God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Today God has heard our prayer and heeded the call to be near. We are a forgiven people. Alleluia. Amen. We pass the peace that passes understanding, for it is the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.
Well, I really don't need to preach a sermon now. <laughs> Let me pause for just a moment as I stand in this pulpit for the first time to say how grateful I am to be here with you all. David Bartlett was a professor of New Testament at Columbia Seminary, and on the day of his last lecture, uh, students and faculty gathered outside the classroom, and when he came out, they gave him a round of applause. And then they waited to hear what he would say uh, on this special moment at the end of his distinguished career. And for a moment, he was choked up. And then he said, in the end, it's all thanks. In the end and in the beginning, it's all thanks. My thanks to the PNC. I've seen several of you here this morning for the journey that we took together. My thanks to so many of you who have paved the way for me to arrive here today and have welcomed me. Those of you who've helped to set up my office. Uh, my thanks to the staff uh, for their commitment and their creativity and their faithfulness. My thanks to Heather for answering more than a few questions for me. To the musicians and the choir for providing our beautiful music today. My thanks to all of you for making this place the special place that it is. To my family, Emily and Anna and Ella, for knowing me and loving me anyway. And my thanks to my dog, Mo, for putting up for all of this transition. In the end and in the beginning, it's all thanks. So, thanks. So let's get to it. Will you pray with me? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to us. I keep forgetting there's people up there. All of you, listen for what the Spirit is saying to us. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, and to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye... Where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The human body 
is an amazing thing. Now, sometimes when you crawl out of bed in the morning, it doesn't feel so amazing, but consider this. A single human body contains a hundred times more cells than there are stars in the galaxy. There are 100 trillion cells in your body and about 200 different kinds of cells. These 100 trillion cells are orchestrated into one magnificent symphony, synergizing with each other for the sake of the whole body. The simplest act, raising your right hand, for example, requires muscle fibers from the head to the toes and from both sides of the body. All these muscle groups, all these trillions of cells working together to make even the simplest of act possible. The human body is an amazing thing. But as we know too well, it's a fragile thing, too subject to toothaches and sprains and strains and rashes and fractures and viruses and just plain wearing out. And I'm just talking about the last two weeks for me. (laughs) The human body is amazing, but it is fragile. We should keep this in mind as we consider our scripture reading for today. Paul imagines the church as a body, the body of Christ. And like all bodies, the church body is an amazing thing. Just like the human body, the church body is made up of millions of different cells all working together. Consider the amazing diversity of churches and practices that claim the name Christian. From the majestic high mass in St. Peter's Basilica to the quiet simplicity of a Quaker meeting, from the intellectual sophistication of St. Thomas Aquinas to the moving simplicity of a spiritual like, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. All this is Christianity. Now, I don't know you all that well yet, but I suspect there's some diversity here in our body as well. Maybe not as much as we would like, but still different genders and ages and backgrounds and perspectives and sports allegiances. Some of us have been Presbyterian our whole lives. Some of us can't even spell Presbyterian. (laughs) Some of us believe all the right things. Some of us aren't really sure what we believe anymore. Some of us want to worship in the traditional way, maybe the way we worshiped as children, the way our parents and our grandparents worship, calls to worship, prayers of confession, organs and hymns. Some of us have grown weary of traditional worship or never experienced it in the first place, so we're longing for another way. Some of us enjoy all different kinds of worship. Some of us don't like any kind of worship at all and only come because our spouses or our parents make us come. It's true, we can admit it. We are a diverse body. And Paul is saying that diversity is a good thing. It gives us resilience. It allows us to be strong and creative in the midst of a changing world. It expands the range of people we can connect with and the the beautiful things that we can do together. But diversity, which can be a great strength, can also be a cause for division. In our reading, Paul talks about what happens when one part of the body begins to think the other parts should all be like it. Instead of seeing diversity as as a strength to be celebrated, it sees it as a threat to be eliminated. The eyes think everybody should be eyes. The, The hands think everybody should be hands. It is the perennial human temptation, isn't it, to think our way is the way. Our way of believing, our way of behaving, our way of worshiping, and then to cut ourselves off from anyone who believes or behaves or worships differently. I called this sermon Remembering the Body. Of course, I want us to remember that we are a body, not a club, not an association, but a body, an organic whole knit together in love. And that means we can't just cut ourselves off from one another. We are called into wholeness by God. And we become all God created us to be only in communion with each other. We are a body, and we need to remember that. But remembering also has a deeper meaning, to remember. 
to put the members of the body back together again. The last couple of years have been awfully tough on all of us. And many of the ties that bind us together as a church have become strained, and maybe even a few of them have snapped. So we're called to remember the body, to be about the patient and joyful work of rebuilding community, reconnecting with one another, stitching the body back together again. And then there's a third sense in which we are called to remember the body. Remember the wounded body of the world. Remember the people on the outside. Remember those in our neighborhood and throughout the world who are broken and despairing and desperately in need of the grace and love that we can offer. That's why we exist as a body in the first place. Well, this is my first sermon here, of course, and the first in a series I've called Odd Practices. Flannery O'Connor famously said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you odd. Faith invites us to see the world differently, to live differently. And so we're going to think about some of the odd practices that we are called to undertake together as people of faith. Well, this is one, to remember the body. In a time when our culture seems to be pulling at the stitches that tie us together, when people are quick to draw lines and break fellowship because of differences of tribe or ideology, we together are undertaking the odd practice of loving each other and loving our neighbor, even in our differences, of sticking it out together as a community. And we don't do this because we're smarter than everybody else, and we don't do this because we're more loving than everybody else. We do this because we believe this is how the Spirit works in us and through us together. We do this because we believe that in the end, that's the only hope there is for our communities and our world. It was Martin Luther King Jr. who said, we must live together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. So what might it look like to be a community that remembers the body? Well, the story is told of a famous monastery that had fallen on hard times. Once upon a time, its many buildings were filled with young monks. People would visit from far and wide to be nourished there. But now it was all but deserted. People no longer came to worship, and only a handful of monks shuffled through the halls, serving God with heavy hearts. On the edge of the monastery woods, an old rabbi had built a little hut, and he would come there from time to time to fast and pray. Well, one day, the abbot of the monastery decided to visit the rabbi and tell him of his sadness. After a time of silence, the rabbi said, You and your brothers are serving God with heavy hearts. You have come here to receive a teaching of me. I will give you a teaching, but you can only repeat it one time. After that, no one must ever say it aloud again. The rabbi looked straight at the abbot and said, The Messiah is among you. For a while... All was silent. Then the abbot left without a word and without looking back. The next morning, the abbot called his monks together. He told them he had received a teaching from the rabbi and that the teaching could be spoken aloud only one time. The rabbi said, the Messiah is among us. Well, the monks were Startled by this, what, what could it mean? Is, is Brother John the Messiah or Brother Matthew or Brother Thomas? Am, am I the Messiah? Or what if it's not one of us but one of the, the visitors that we receive? They were all deeply puzzled by the rabbi's teaching, but no one ever mentioned it again. As time went by, the monks began to treat one another with a new and very special reverence. A gentle, warm-hearted spirit began to grow among them. The teaching took root in their hearts, 
And they began to live with both contentment and expectation. When visitors came to the monastery, they were deeply moved by the life of these monks. They too were treated with great compassion and reverence, for who knows, one of them could be the one. Word spread, and before long, people were coming from far and wide to worship with these monks and experience their loving spirit. Soon, other young people were once again asking to become a part of the community, and the community grew, and the flame was rekindled, and hope was reborn. Well, friends, I am no rabbi wandering in the woods, but I have a teaching for you. The Messiah is among us, and so we are called to love one another. We are called to set aside fear and self-interest. We are called to work together with passion and grace, to engage in the odd practice of remembering the body. This is our challenge. This is our calling. And if we will let it be, this is our joy. Thanks be to God. Amen. Remain standing as we affirm our faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come to us in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new. We trust in God who calls us to be the church, to love and serve others, to seek justice resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our way and our hope. In life and in death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I would like to invite our Quest participants and their partners to please come forward.
don't y'all stand on the top step and then the kids can stand, yeah. Friends, I present to you the Quest class of 22-23. This is a wonderful group of young people and adults who have come alongside them. As you might know, our Quest class meets from September through April. They talk a lot about different topics, discussing our Reformed heritage as Presbyterians. They pull out topics like, how can God be three in one and one in three at the same time? Who wrote the Bible? I still have an issue with the whole, you know, only men. (laughs) They discover all kinds of things about their own faith, and their partner discovers things about their faith. It's a wonderful relationship that is nurtured through the baptismal liturgy and promises that you all made to many of them when they were born. I would like to thank especially the teachers, um, This year, Sarah Shoemate, Sarah's back there, and Guy Garino, where's Guy? There he is. Um, And I will be teaching our um, youth this year. I would also like to thank Laura Paschal, Laura's right here, and Rhonda Nichols, who put so much of this together this year um, in lieu of all kinds of changing transitions with our staff. Um, So thank you to both of you especially, and thank you to the co-teachers. We're going to have fun this year. I um, remind you that this is not an ordinary day. When God's people gather for worship, it is anything but ordinary. And so let us be reminded that though we are many as members of this church, First Presbyterian, we have many gifts, but as Richard has already reminded us, we are one. And so I will ask you, First Presbyterian, now to fulfill some of your baptismal promises and the responsibilities to care and support for these young people along the way. Will you, the many members of First Presbyterian Church and the one body of Christ, commit to hold these young people close to your hearts in prayer? Will you? Will you pledge to be a congregation that welcomes their questions and their doubts. Will you? Confirmation partners, I ask you, will you covenant to be with them on their journey, fulfilling your role as partner each step of the way? Will you? And participants, questers, I ask you, will you seek to be eager and willing participants Ready to learn, to share, to be excited. For this, your journey of quest and confirmation faith, will you, questers? I would like to introduce to you, I have a paper here so I don't forget anyone, our participants this year, Carson Berry right here. Her quest partner is Kathy Davis, and Kathy is not able to be here this morning, so Megan Texer is standing in. Alex DeBettencourt and his partner is Jim Campbell. Lucy Rose East, her partner is Ryan Lovern. Banks Lovern and his partner is Keith Nichols. Abby Smith and her partner is Mandy Hildebrand. Felix Yerudi, whose partner is Zach Taylor. And Robert Winfield, whose partner is Dave Rao. Kennedy Taylor is also a questor but could not be here this morning, and Megan Texer is her quest partner. And now I ask you, having met these wonderful young people, will you, members and leaders of this church, quest teachers, confirmation partners, will we together, as the body of Christ, Covenant to be faithful disciples of Jesus in word and in deed, in study and service, in work and play. And let the church resoundingly say, We will. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, you are truly the source of all beginnings. We pray for your blessing as our church family begins a new confirmation study. Be with these teachers as they guide these young people through scripture and tradition. Be with these partners as they walk alongside these young people to encourage and enrich. Be with these families as youth and adult alike grow in your likeness. Be with these young people as they search their own hearts and minds for your claim and your call. We ask that your spirit be our guide and our companion through this journey and all journeys that are yet to come. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. May be seated. Thank you. It is in giving that we truly receive, and having seen these young people, having heard our new pastor, I don't see any reason that you shouldn't dig deep and find a way to continue to support the good things that God does through this congregation in this place. If you have brought an offering with you, there are baskets in the back, and there are instructions for you to give online. The morning offering. has no body now but yours no hands no feet on earth but yours yours are the eyes with which he sees yours are the feet with which he walks. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Christ has no Let us pray. Christ, you empower us to be your people, and we rely on your spirit and pray that you would continue to guide and direct the ministry of all that we say and do. 
If, O oh Lord, we are to be the body of Christ, we ask that you remind us that we need not all look, act, or be the same. For in your divine creative diversity, you gave each of us gifts, gifts that in community enrich this vast and beautiful world. Give us the grace and strength to let others live lives of abundant fullness. Give us strength and grace to allow ourselves to live lives of enormous fullness. Because it is in the fullness of you, O Christ, that you have crafted a body of believers who are your hands and feet your very heart and soul in this vast creative world. As we consider what you would will for our lives to be, how you wish our love to be poured out, we pause to acknowledge the reality of brokenness and tragedy, trauma, and violence. For wounds that take time to heal, we ask for loving patience. For in remembering this day, so much was wounded. But in you, O oh God, the body survives the body thrives, and the body is resurrected. Claiming these truths, may they strengthen this body of believers who are bold enough to pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father,
friends a reminder that there's a reception immediately following the service. I'll invite my family to join, we, join me as we make our way to Fellowship Hall, if I can find Fellowship Hall. <laughs> if I don't make it, I trust one of you will come and find us. Friends, let us go out remembering the body. Let us go out loving one another, loving our neighbor, living with hope and with joy. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace now and always. Amen.